All right, I think it's time to get going. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Library of Congress. Welcome to Live at the Library. Welcome to Artists Approach the Book. Uh, my name is Emily Moore. I am the Assistant Curator of the Aramount Library here in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division. And I am thrilled to be on stage tonight to engage in what I think is gonna be a really interesting, wide-ranging, maybe surprising, definitely fun conversation. Uh, before we jump in, I have just a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who may not have been with us earlier today, this event is really sort of the capstone of a symposium that we've been having to celebrate the Aramont Library. And the Aramont is a modernist collection of about 1,700 volumes that was donated to the library in 2020. It's first editions, it's livre d'artistes, it's exhibition bindings. Hopefully, you are able to see our display this evening. If you missed the display or you wanna see more, it's not a problem. You can just get in touch with anybody in the Rare Book Division and we'll talk you through the whole collection. So the collection came to the library in 2020 as an anonymous donation. It was accompanied by a very generous endowment. That endowment is how I am at the library. It's how we're all here tonight. So I just wanna extend a lot of gratitude to the donor family for their support of the work that we do here at the library. Yeah. I also want to thank all of my wonderful colleagues at the library. Uh, an event like this truly takes an entire library. <laughs> um, so first, everybody in the Rare Books and Special Collections Division, it's been a real all hands on deck day. So thank you everybody. Thank you especially Stephanie and Mark for this opportunity. Uh, and I also want to thank all of our other wonderful volunteers. We had people from the main reading room. We had people from cataloging, all pitch in and I'm super grateful. I also wanna make sure to thank our tech team, MMG, OCIO, you guys are incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, Latarsha, Tom, thank you. And then the same goes for our special events folks and our library events office. Michelle has been an angel uh, and also Mary and Katie. So thank you everyone. We are gonna have a Q&A this evening. Uh, we're gonna just keep what we were gonna do initially this afternoon. If you have questions, just raise your hand. One of my colleagues will come around with a piece of paper. We're just gonna write our questions down and then pass them up and try to get through as many as we can. I'm gonna just do a brief introduction of all of these wonderful people and then I'm gonna pass it over so that they can speak for themselves. Uh, so tonight I'm joined on stage by Robin Holder. Robin is a visual artist from New Jersey. To her left, we have Ken Schur. Ken is the co-owner and proprietor of the Two Ponds Press out of Maine. And then last but not least, we have Jamie Murphy. Uh, Jamie operates under the imprint The Salvage Press, and he joins us tonight from Dublin, Ireland. So welcome, you guys. And yeah. So Robin, take it away. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm... American. I'm a woman, and I'm really delighted to have um, 10 of my works, which are a collection of pieces that are commentary on our federal holidays, be acquired by the Library of Congress. And I thank Mark, who is a brilliant, brilliant person here. I'm really very interested in identity, and I'm interested in the different demographics of us, um, throughout the United States and throughout the world. So a lot of my work reflects that, um, very much from a point of view of access or lack of access to resources and information. I do primarily works on paper in which I apply printmaking techniques, painting, and drawing. So the books that I uh, have created that are in the collection here, and I believe one of them, the Martin Luther Day, uh, book was on view downstairs, um, are interesting constructions that are layered. I don't know if any of you here are visual artists. Can I see a show of hands if there are any visual artists here? Okay, so we visual artists are approaching things in a very private way in which we're exploring techniques using particular media and trying to thread that with a concept or a feeling or a theme. So I think that's about briefly what I can say. I could talk for seven hours, so I'm not gonna take any more time. What about you, Ken? Okay, so I am not a visual artist. I am uh, a collector, a dealer, a publisher, 
Um, and I'm, so I'm here to represent sort of the, the other end of the spectrum, what is uh, necessary to get these books out there to the public and to make the collaborations come together. I started off um, it, running a, a small antiquarian bookstore in a little coastal village in Maine in the late 70s, and uh, within a few years, I had met the artist Leonard Baskin, and that changed um, the whole course and direction of my uh, professional career after that. I got very interested in his Gehenna Press and um, started collecting it myself, and uh, he gave me the opportunity to sell some of his books, and I was successful, and he um, asked if I would be his agent. So I kept running the antiquarian book business, but I took on, and he became my mentor. I became the, uh, um, he, he, he would, used to boast that he was the only private press in America that had its own agent and representative. So. Um, he also called what we were doing the lunatic fringe, and that's a whole other story, which uh, I think you'll get a better sense of tonight. Um, but uh, so that uh, working with him brought me to the Library of Congress in 1992, where we organized an exhibition uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Gehenna Press, and it was under some of the previous curators, Peter uh, uh, Larry Sullivan. Um, who was then in the role that Mark Demunation is in now, and Peter Van Wingen, who is no longer with us. But we had a, a, a wonderful exhibition. It was a, a traveling exhibition. But anyway, I got deeper and deeper into the world of, of fine, uh, fine printing and private press. Uh, Baskin passed away in 2000, um, and I started working with a number of the book artists who had uh, worked with him either as printers, binders, and started representing those different presses. And then um, uh, I was approached by the widow of Anthony Hecht, who um, had collaborated with Leonard Baskin from the 1950s until the, one of the final books they did together in the 90s. And she asked if um, I would publish, uh, I've ever thought of publishing um, some of his poems. So it seemed to me to be the, the logical connection, uh, connecting tissue between what uh, Gehenna and Baskin were doing and the establishment of, of my own press. Um, the Two Ponds Press, and we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year, and, um, and my wife, Lee Rockefeller, is here as well. She and I are partners in this venture, and um, so I hope to be able to shed a little light on what's involved from the publishing standpoint, um, as, because we've got some wonderful printers and visual artists here on the panel as well. You're up, Jamie. Um, I'm not in this as long as Ken. I'm not in this as long as Robin. Um, I came to this um, field of bookmaking through a previous life as a graphic designer and um, a printmaker, um, a typographer. My background is in the history of art and design and visual communication. And my postgraduate work was in design primarily through letterpress printing. So I'm here as a letterpress printer, but also as a publisher, as a sort of a, a collaborator, I like to try and bring lots of disciplines together to make books. Um, thank you to Stephanie and to Emily for asking me to come here tonight. The Library of Congress um, have been collecting my work for some years and it's been a privilege. Um, and I guess uh, from, as a bookmaker, I try to make books that are sort of not um, focused in one direction, but maybe guided by text or guided by image or guided by maybe a deeper concept, um, primarily of Irish origin or Irish sort of uh, um, interest. Um, and yeah, that's me. Thank Wonderful. You. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So to start the conversation, I've got a pretty broad question and I'm going to open it with you, Robin. You're a visual artist who has only recently moved into the book arts world with your series, Our Social Skin. So tell me, why the book? Well, actually, I haven't just recently moved into book arts. <laughs> uh, uh, that group of books that you have acquired here at the Library of Congress is a series of 10, so it's maybe the most um, substantial grouping of artist books that I made, but I've been making artist books on and off for probably about 20 years. The reason that I make books is, as a visual artist, I'm sort of um, absolutely convinced that I will not stagnate if I change my media for each series. 
I discovered about 40 years ago that a lot of the artists, the visual artists that I admired, really upon creating um, a concentrated, centered visual style or expression, continued then to do the same thing over and over and over again for 20, 30, and 40 years. And that really frightened me because I'm really interested in the creative process itself. And the creative process is a very, um, you could call it almost, it's a challenge to one's courage because you have to do something that you think is a substantial and meaningful and well-crafted and visually articulated in a way that satisfies you and in my case, that delivers a message that can be digested by other people. So it's a, my um, challenge is <laughs> really trying to do something that I can't do. <laughs> so every time I, I usually come up with a restlessness for a particular media or technique or theme. And then when I start brainstorming that, it kind of tells me what way will be the most appropriate way. So that's why I made those books. And also because I wasn't granted a grant, I submitted a very extensive proposal for the Smithsonian. They didn't give it to me. So I said, OK, well, I like my idea anyway. I'm just going to keep working on it. And I actually, as I was telling Catherine Blood just a few minutes ago, it ended up being something that I feel very proud of. And I was able to really do what I like to do, which is explore, experiment, put myself in a position where I actually don't know what's going to happen. So before I created the 10 books, and each of those 10 books I created in an edition of five because I have a printmaking background and I guess I'm obsessed with doing multiples even though they're not exactly, exactly alike. They're very similar. But I think um, that's how I decide, Emily, what to do and how to do it. It's really a quest to um, try to do something a little beyond what I think I'm capable of doing, and that puts me in a position of exploring, experimenting, researching, um, doing something where I can, what you experience as failure, meaning it, you can't, you don't create something that you expected, but then taking that failure or that whatever it is that didn't work out and making it getting to a point where it's satisfying and fulfilling the image or the vision that I have. So if if that makes sense, I, I would say that I'm really propelled by um, the concept and the need to create something in a different way. It's interesting because it does make me think too that your work, you know, we have it in the rare book division, but then of course you also have work in prints and photographs as well here. So you kind of, yes, yeah, span those worlds, which is something that we straddle pretty regularly. Uh, Jamie, what about you? What's your earliest book work? Or the earliest one you choose to share? Well, um, my earliest book work was as an undergraduate. Um, I had found letterpress printing, and it was this eureka moment where I felt that actually I found like a home. That's a very difficult thing to explain, but when you're interested in typography, you're interested in engineering, you're interested in art and design and fashion and architecture and politics and all these things, all of a sudden the written word, the idea of working with type um, becomes hugely meaningful. And the idea of letterpress printing, this idea that you can make work primarily through typography, through this vehicle of letterpress printing, that was a eureka moment. And so the earliest book was 2006, um, and it has a relationship to um, the US. It was a bunch of um, satirical writings from Ambrose Bierce, and it was called, from his Devil's Dictionary, um, and it was called The Devil and Today, and it was this idea, and it was an idea I came back to later again, was taking early texts and in, so, you, in some way or other, relating them to a present moment. 
And so Ambrose Beer spoke about, um, he spoke about civil rights, he spoke about misogyny, he spoke about the rights of uh, migrants. He spoke about all these things in 1911, 1912, and they were really, really relevant to this time when I was printing. And so I was using those texts, but then I was trying to make images that related to um, you know, a more contemporary society. And so that w became a sort of a running theme, but I had sort of, sort of found it early on in my sort of journey as an undergraduate. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, and with you, Ken, you mentioned that you sort of, not necessarily started, but that you worked with Leonard Baskin and the Gehenna Press. Moving forward to Two Ponds Press, what was the first project that you guys did at Two Ponds? Well, I, I, I briefly mentioned it, and that was um, the uh, Anthony Hecht project. And that was um, a book called Interior Skies, uh, Late Poems from Liguria. Uh, Anthony Hecht, a former, I believe, uh, at least presidential poet or poet laureate, um, was, uh, uh, was a lifelong uh, admirer of, uh, and collaborator with Leonard Baskin. I got to meet him and, um, before, and he actually eulogized Leonard at, uh, at Baskin's funeral. So when his uh, widow, Helen Hecht, approached us, um, this was the impetus that we needed to really start the press uh, rolling. And uh, so that was a, you know, an edition of 75 copies. We uh, commissioned Abigail Rohrer, who is a brilliant um, etcher, um, a wood engraver, to do an illust to some illustrations for it. She had never met Hecht, so she was working from a, a photograph to do a portrait of him. Um, and another one of the coastline of Liguria. So that really was uh, dipping our toes in the water, but the, the book that really um, got us, uh, put us on the map, so to speak, was uh, the one that's on exhibition right here tonight. It was on exhibition out, out in the uh, hallway, and that was The Little River by Margaret Wise Brown. Um, we were in the fortunate position to have a uh, unpublished manuscript. Margaret Wise Brown, of course, is the children's book writer who wrote Goodnight Moon and The Runaway Bunny, and you know, a, an iconic children's book writer. And um, uh, Leib's father happened to have been engaged to her at the time of her death, and she died um, tragically at the age of 42, leaving behind, really at the height of her career, leaving behind this, um, a body of work that had not been published. Um, Margaret was really uh, um, devoted to making sure that the illustrators to her books got paid equally um, with her, which is something that was unheard of in the publishing world. So our, our, we, had this un, we had this manuscript, it was in, you know, actu a, an actual manuscript in her hand and written on her notebook paper. And, um, but we were presented with this problem, okay, well, let's, do like what Mar let's do what Margaret would do and let's uh, em employ an illustrator to do something unique with this project to make an artist book from it. So we worked with Michael Kutch who had a, has his own press, the Double Elephant Press, and he came up with um, a series of nature printed etchings using natural materials. It's a, I don't know if you've had, a, if anybody had a chance to see it tonight, they had at least a page or, or two on display of this book. And it was um, an extraordinary, he said it nearly killed him. It took him over a year to, to, to print it because it was, you know, you'd be running feathers and bones and things through the etching press and they get crushed and they make, you know, terrible plate impressions. But um, he completed it. Um, we were able to bring an unpublished text to, to birth. We entered it at the Oxford and Fine Press book, book Fair, which is where I think I maybe first met Jamie. And it won two of the prizes of the you know, Best Illustrated Book and the Judge's Choice Award. So that really put us on the map. That was, I think, our second book that we had ever published after the, the Heck Project. And I met the young Jamie Murphy there and said, and we saw his work and saw um, the incredible things that he was doing. And we said, you know, you need to get over to Codex and show your work to the American audience because this is where you're really gonna um, um, hit it big. And I think uh, he'll bear me out in this, that it, it was a major move for him. And uh, yeah, it, it really was successful. So anyway, that was, that was the beginning of the press. And we've done uh, 10 years, 10 books. We've uh, just had a retrospective exhibition at the Bowdoin College Library of um, the first 10 years of the press. 
And so that's when we hope to at least have another 10 to go. I sure hope so. Well, I think The Little River is such an interesting book because it does. there's this collaboration with a late author, there's this collaboration with an artist, there's a collaboration with nature, there's a collaboration with history. So I'd be really curious to hear what you guys have to say about the collaborative element of your work, whether it's with artists and poets, as um, Ken and Jamie do, or if it's with histories and institutions and identities, how you kind of navigate those collaborative elements. Well, from my point of view, um, they can sort of materialize in different ways. Um, sometimes a text will fall in your lap and then you try and build a project around a text. Sometimes you want to work with an artist, so you kind of build a project around maybe how the artist might feel or how they might want to approach a project. Or maybe you have a concept for a project and then you bring in specialists that might help you sort of realize that vision. Um, in my more recent books, it's, it's gone into the latter. And I definitely started out with sort of out of copyright texts, you know, as most people do, you start at the bottom rung and work your way up to sort of getting confidence and maybe getting your skill set together better. And, you know, as you, as you go to fairs and meet people, and like Ken said, all of a sudden I, I kind of broke out of this little Ireland, UK bubble and went to the States. And all of a sudden it's, it's, a, it's a new world and, and, you know, it's a new landscape. There's a much wider audience and much, you, you know, just this, this skill set, the, the amount of information and um, just knowledge that you can just pick up by just, at, just over coffee, over breakfast, just these little chance meetings. And then, you know, by doing that, all of a sudden you're introduced to people you can collaborate with, binders, printmakers, paper makers, marblers, ink, ink manufacturers, you know, writers, whatever it is. There's, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole volley of people that would never have been introduced to me had I not come to the States. And I mean, here we are, <laughs> Library of Congress. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I'm still a small fish in a big pond. But this, you know, it feels, it feels like, you know, it, it's ever increasing in sort of um, in importance to me and to what I do as, as, you know, as a creative. And I, I'd like to say that it's really, as a publisher, um, it's all about collaborations. And I, I think I had a, uh, a little bit of a head start because after working with Gehenna Press and Baskin for an, over a dozen years, I got to meet the, the best printers, the best uh, binders, the, the people that I continued to work with. So um, forging these collaborations came a little bit easier for me, but we're still exploring. We've worked with, um, uh, we're working with a new graphic designer artist who's done our, our last two projects with us. But really, as a, as a fine press publisher, it's all about collaboration. And I think that is the, that's the, really the critical point that I'd like to make. I think when, when what Ken and Leave do really well is work with the best people for the job. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're able to be in a position where you work with the best people for every job, then it's almost like you know, no stone is left unturned. Every little, every little minute detail of a book is considered, and that's a considered book. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you can answer any question on any part of the book, well, then you've, you, it's a successful job. You know? And in very few people can make every single part of a book to those standards, and so that's why we collaborate. You know. mm. But also, collaboration is sort of like the spark. You know, y you think, I mean, Robin um, touched on the idea of the unknown. You know, you go into a project, you don't know where it's going to end up. Well, that's every project. You think you know where it's going to end up. You have this vision for it. You've, you've you know, painstakingly designed it, funded it, brought it to the very edge and then all of a sudden it takes a little turn or something doesn't work or that print that you had banked on is, is a failure, you've got to go another direction and that's sort of the fun of it. Mm -hmm. And then in there lies like the unknown, this idea of, you know, we, we throw all our dice and hopefully, you know, hopefully it works out. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm really listening intently to what you're saying. Um, what I could share about collaboration is I witnessed um, for about 11 years, I was the assistant director at Bob Blackburn's printmaking workshop in New York and watching that really sacred, mysterious, um, very fragile and delicate relationship between an artist with a vision 
and a printer with skills and understanding trying to connect in order to create something that's satisfying, fulfilling for both of them. That was fascinating. My personal relationship with collaboration comes through a number of um, public art commissions that I was grateful to create. Uh, one was 6,500 square feet of uh, molded um, pigmented concrete, a walkway. And another one was um, 24 windows for the MTA for the New York City public school system. Another one was eight wall installations with painted wooden figures, lighting, and ceramic tile. So what I learned is exactly what you're saying is you get fabricators who are really skilled and knowledgeable, but open enough to listen <laughs> to your insane ideas. <laughs> what I found out as an artist, I mean, I'm very obsessive and a control freak, of course, because I'm creating what I think I should create, was that I really had to understand a little bit of the mechanics and the chemistry of the materials that were going to be industrially fabricated um, to my specifications. So that the experiences I have working with people who create ceramic tile, people that create field concrete and um, molds, concretes for mold and um, laminated windows and stained glass windows and lighting and carpentry gave me um, an opportunity to really work with the trades, which is something very dear to my heart, as I was telling Catherine before. I always felt like I was, I think this is not picking up. Okay, there we go. I, I always felt like I, 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 I admire people who work with their hands. And I always wondered as a child, why are the people who work with their hands, the people that build things, the farmers, the um, blue collar workers, why don't they have more respect and appreciation in the, in the society? And I always felt like I was like trapped in an intellectual life. <laughs> so I had the opportunity through the public art commissions that I was able to realize to have that experience learning a little bit, I mean, basically learning enough to know what questions to ask. And I think that's a very humbling thing and I think as a person that's creative, it's healthy to be, to be dealing with humility as well as power because when you're doing this kind of enterprise creating a public art commission, you're creating something that hundreds, even thousands of people will interact with. So that, um, that for me is a challenge to my ego and something really rewarding. It's interesting listening to you. I have sort of a two-pronged question to follow up with that for everybody. Uh, sort of branching off of the collaboration piece, I think that something that's special about visual art in general, but then perhaps books specifically, is that there's this collaboration that happens with the viewer. So I'm curious to hear about who your audience is and hearing you talk about the importance of the manufacturing and working with experts who actually understand materials, it also makes me think about the realities of use and wear with books. And I'm curious about how you navigate knowing that people are gonna touch this, they're gonna put it on a shelf, they might throw it in a bag, probably not throw it in a bag, but it's possible. So how do you navigate the use and wear of the art that you're creating? Will I start? <laughs> um, you know, different people who make different books will have a different answer to this, but I try to make books for me. And then if, you know, as, as an artist, as you make art that appeases your sort of vision or your own, um, you know, what Robin might refer to as your private thing, you know, this thing that you're trying to make this art. Um, and if it can be accepted by an audience, then all well and good. But I try not to make books to appease an audience. Um, which is a 
really kind of a strange thing to say about books, maybe, because all the great books are made to appease an audience. Except but, Ulysses. Except Ulysses, uh, um, which is, of course, Dublin. Yep. Uh, but um, I think if you're able to sort of um, create books that you're happy with, and then hopefully um, your sort of um, your vision and your ideas will hopefully be a sort of uh, they'll be taken on by other people. You know, the actual audience themselves. Um, books range in value from you know one cent to a million or whatever it is, and so audiences differ. Um, books at the level that I make them at, the level that Ken makes them at, the level that Robin makes them at, they tend to be valuable objects, themselves art objects. And so a lot of the time, these books end up in collections, which makes them more accessible to public, um, private collections, but also public collections and institutional collections. We work a lot with special collections libraries where these educational institutions make these books available to kind of a greater amount of people than could ever be possible by one person alone. They tend to be made in limitation. The book I mentioned from 2006, I think there was 20. You know, I currently make books at about 80. You know, they tend not to be made in their thousands, you know, um, at this particular level. Yeah. I, well, I think the, the point that Jamie raises about the uh, accessibility factor for um, public institutions and libraries is, is really important in, in these tiny editions that we do. I think none of us are, well, Jamie and I at least, are not doing any editions, you know, larger than 100 copies. And they're finely printed, they're fairly delicate. We have to be careful about materials that we're using so that we're, that they, they, they will stand up. They're not going, there's archival issues that you're dealing with. I think maybe that was part of your question, I think. But in terms of the audience, I think that it really, um, to me, it's so important to have something that is going to have a wider um, range of usage. And when I have librarians tell me, particularly in university situations, that they have professors that are asking for these particular books because they tie in directly with curriculum that they are teaching. And when, and when the students get to see these artist books that they would not normally be um, exposed to, they, it, it's, it's eye-opening for them. They all of a sudden see, oh, here is how a book, an artist's book, an artist's statement can deal directly with something that we are discussing, whether it's immigration or climate change or, you know, and, and this maybe opens up another area that uh, Robin briefly touched on about um, dealing with issues of um, uh, social change or um, uh, uh, political implications or you know, much broader issues like climate change. So maybe that's something that would be a follow-up to what I'm trying to raise here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, is this, am I doing this right? Okay. I think what, what we're really talking about is there's a, um, there are people that are brokers to the dissemination of arts and culture, and it's a, it's a, it's a very exclusive elite reality. And I think what we, um, certainly what we see happening here at the Library of Congress, uh, spearheaded with, by people like Mark Demunation, Emily, Stephanie, um, is that there is a passion to share the collections with the public. Now, what's missing is some sort of uh, way of connecting more with a wider public, with a more grassroots public. I think I, in my uh, activity as an artist, the, my books are not made to be handled that much. They're really made from a point of view of uh, putting on a wall or on a stand in an exhibition. But I think now that we're in the digital age, it's much easier to share uh, what we're doing here in terms of books and culture in general. But that's such a good question, Emily, is who is our audience? What is the demographic? And that's something that, uh, to be honest, includes a lot of sexism and racism and imperialism, and we all know that, and that's the elephant in the room, and I think some of, them are, of us are really thinking about ways to open that up and to share what we're doing um, via online uh, libraries, via 
situations like this and others. But that's, I really feel that what's being done here in the artist's books collection and the Aramont collection is really a positive endeavor to really bring art to a much bigger audience and find ways to bring the audiences to the library. You know, it's interesting, being a librarian, working in a library, there's a lot of conversation around what our role is in terms of providing access, but then also providing value-added information. And I think that sometimes for more complex, particularly artist books, uh, they can be difficult to interact with, they can be difficult to understand, and we as librarians are trying to figure out ways to kind of communicate what the artist's intentions was or what the meaning of the book is without actually dictating with people what to see. So I'm curious to hear you talk about how you understand institutions like libraries, if it's different than an institution like a museum, on your end of the scale, do you see those things as different or do you see them as the same? Well, um, I happen to be <laughs> in a position where recently I was commissioned by the National Gallery of Ireland to produce the first artist's book um, for the National Gallery, which was to go on display in, in, a, in you know, these big vitrines uh, you know, a million people get to see it. It's a sort of a big deal for me. But when I'm, my background, of course, is making books in these editions where you try to make them accessible. And after that, they go into libraries, they go to private collections, they go to different collections. But the museum itself is such an accessible... In Ireland, by the way, all museums are free. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really amazing thing. Almost like public libraries, everything's accessible. Everything is sort of at that um, ground level. Um, and so, you know, I think the difference between collect, you know, institutions and museums, they all serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, a museum has a sort of uh, a role to play with society, as do libraries, as do institutions, you know. They are different. Um, in order to make a book for um, a gallery or for an exhibition situation, you have to kind of, you know, I think about the book for display. At wh um, how, how often do you see a book on display and wonder what you can't see? Mm -hmm. You know, so this particular book that was made for the gallery in Ireland um, was, was a lot of loose leaves that would fold and could be all seen in one go. And that was important for the exhibition purpose. Um, so I guess it's about context. If you're, if you're working on a book that's to be seen in that situation, you might consider the exhibition, but if you're working on a book that's to be held in the hand mm -hmm. and sort of revered, just at you know 18 inches from your face mm -hmm. then that's a different thing to consider you know then it's about paper and tactility and touch but if it's behind glass it's a completely different relationship you know yeah. I also think that um, for for me for in my experience over the years that um, museums are not particularly interested with a few rare exceptions it's libraries and that I think um, boils down to the differentiation between the book as art and art that you can hang on your wall. And so, I mean, it, it was difficult. They, they did a beautiful display here tonight, but you, you basically could see either one page opening or the binding. And I know a lot of people said, oh, we couldn't touch them, so we really couldn't see what was inside. Anyway, that was, that's the, the differentiation between libraries are set up. I mean, if you go to special collections, you can ask to see the books, and, then, and you will show them to them. Um, but So I find that museums are much more problematic. I'm, I'm glad that Jamie was able to get that, that work in the National Gallery of Ireland. But there again, it had to be in a format that could be on easily exhibitable. I think it's a very rare occurrence as yeah. well. It, it's 2022 they commissioned the first artist book in the country for a national institution like that. It's quite late, you know, to the game. Yeah. But, uh, but also it needs to be acknowledged that they, have, they are acknowledging the idea of the book. And so I think it's progress, you know. Absolutely. I'd, like, I'd like to see more institutions. Well, first I, I have to say is I think it requires um, filming somebody interacting and walking through a book, like I understand Mark Demunation recently shared um, some book art with his colleagues here at the Library of Congress, and I was blessed to be part of him showing a number of books to um, some a, a very special collector months ago. If that is filmed 
and somebody knowledgeable walks through it, explains the artist's intentions, the materials, and shows a good amount of the book, that can be shared in, in many ways. I remember um, sometime in the, probably was the early 1990s, the New York Foundation for the Arts filmed me pulling a print and used it as a public service TV commercial to uh, let people know that there's this state art agency and art is being made. So I think in our culture, look, we're, you know, we're shopping all the time here in this country. So <laughs> I remember when I was in Cuba, they, they didn't have money to go shopping. So all of the people, the doorman, the, the maid, they could tell you about the current uh, writers, the current dancers, the artists, the playwrights, the musicians, because they're exploring and sharing their culture. So if, this, if the psyche of the American people is directed towards the plethora of extraordinary creative art that's going on, and if the museums, like you, you're saying, the museums and the libraries and the state institutions and the schools and the universities promote an accessible version of not only the book arts, but the arts in general, I think we'd, we'd, be, we'd be really well served. Agreed. Well, in thinking about access and also tactility of the object, has digitization, like the reality of that, changed your practice? You mentioned this briefly, Robin, but I'm curious how you feel about that. You mean digitization of the texts themselves? Yeah. Well, not particularly. I tend to make books by hand that are in that sort of fine press tradition. So it's all about materials and, you know, uh, Actually, it's, it's all about materials when it comes to the tactility and the physical object. But then, you know, um, I think all three of us have been involved in filmmaking, and then, you know, you've got this idea of having an online presence. You know, and ha to have that online presence, you've got to work with photography, you've got to work with some way to sort of display your work in that digital presence where it just exists as light on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you take this, the whisper of paper, you know, the idea of, you know, the idea of leather, how the smell of leather, how do you transfer that somehow to give a meaning, give it some sort of a presence on screen. Mm -hmm. So rather than the digitization of books or the idea of e-readers, that doesn't really affect us, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. speaking broadly, it doesn't affect people who make books by hand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more for mass consumption of text, you know. It's interesting because I'm thinking about your website and particularly how your books all have these beautiful films that go along with them with really amazing voiceover and that it's a value added piece. It's not taking that object and making it a digital surrogate. It's offering sort of a digital accompaniment to it. That's very different. That's very valuable. Yeah, we, we do that. We just don't digitize everything. Yeah. And, and, and you know, f f those little films, well, in my ones in particular, they're, they really mark the idea of a moment, I think it would be amazing to go back to Ulysses and imagine someone made a film about the making of it. The idea of Joyce knocking around in the print shop, you know, doing this idea of adding a third of the book at proof. I can imagine it was a violent scene. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know so yeah. if you're able to make these books that sort of, you know, encapsulate a project, then they exist um, forever and, you know, Everyone involved in the project tends to get a, a role in those films and they're just a sort of an accompaniment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robin, how do books fit into sort of your constellation of visual practice? Mm, that's a good, I mean, you know, I'm an African-American, uh, Russian Jewish woman. I, I have this narrative I want to share. I, I feel like, I try to find and focus on and learn about the core of the human spirit. And to be honest with you, every day I'm kind of like fascinated that most of us get up and start a day with all of the difficulties that most of us have to deal with in one way or another. So I think Bookmaking is a natural media for storytelling. 
And um, I remember somewhere in the early 90s, I, I had an exhibition and somebody said, you know, there's all these narratives in your artwork you really should um, incorporate somehow storytelling into your work. And I, that's when I started putting text in my imagery. And I feel that bookmaking, um, to kind of touch on what Jamie's saying, is that, that that intimacy of the materials, the smell, the texture, the feel of the materials, and the process that uh, I and everybody goes through to make a book is, is truly a, a wondrous um, reality. I mean, by the time we finish the book, it's like, yeah, so what? You know, it's like, <laughs> so if, if we were able to capture, to film the process of making a book and the process of trying to decide what to put in a book and try to understand the intention of telling a story with images and materials and text, um, it might inspire people to not only want to make books themselves, but to look more at books and to treasure the wonder of books. Um, unfortunately, with all the flash communications that we have in the, quote, digital age, I think a lot of people have fallen off of books. I remember when I was um, in middle school, so age 11, 12, I would take out six books from the library every week from the St. Agnes Library because you were allowed to take six. And taking those six books out got me addicted to exploring the world, to learning about other people's realities, to take it, words and create my own scenarios. It's a very creative thing to read a book, to handle a book. I mean, the books I was reading were not artist books, but the idea of books holding an entire truth, an entire world, an entire experience is very magical. Absolutely. I think one um, encouraging movement is that I, I, I have seen a lot more interest in um, learning about the arts of, of, of the fine printing and the press. I know there is, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an area that's gone through ups and downs over the years, but there are programs now around the country. We have one in, in Maine that is, is, is part of a photographic workshop, but it's really become much more, a, a very popular part of it, and that is learning about etching printing and learning about um, how you incorporate photographic techniques within the fine press movement. And I think that seems to be an area that is um, still, it's out there, it's not a, a, a widespread movement at the moment, but it's still, it's, it's a seed is there, it's growing, and there are more, young, more and more young people that are taking up those, those arts and those crafts, and uh, that will then enable them to have a better understanding, appreciation, and creation of, uh, of finely printed books. Yeah, I think there's a yearning for that like physicality and then also for that pacing. You know, it takes a little while to get somewhere. Uh, so we have just a few minutes left. I do want to open it up for questions if anybody has any. I have more that I would love to ask if nobody has a question. Yes. near this. Um, in the museum situation, there's been a lot of um, pressure to have uh, digital access to books so that a book will be displayed, but it'll be displayed with one page, you know, and then they want to make sure that there's some digital representation so that you can have that walk through of the book, but at the same time, you've lost the intimacy of working with a book. And that's a really hard bridge, and I didn't know if you have any comment about that. Um, I, um, I, 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 if I go back just briefly to what I mentioned about the gallery, the idea of the book being designed for presentation, um, I think we've all seen ex exhibits where 
a book is presented, but then also there's a reel of images or there's like a digital accompaniment or there's an online exhibition. The idea of an online exhibition seems really foreign to the book, but actually it works quite well when it's about like, you know, a whole ovary or, or you know, if it's like something like the Aramon collection, for instance, if someone was to try and get an overview, it works really well. But if you want to study one particular book closely, then it's all about getting hands on, you know? Yeah, you mentioned that um, museums are resisting the idea of, of um, access to books like that, and I, and I agree with you. I can't elaborate on that. <laughs> I th uh, Hannah, you're asking something that's sort of like, there's no way around it. The more um, unique the book is regarding the materials, the construction, the more precious it is, and you can't have masses and masses of people actually handle, handling that book. You know, that there, we can't pretend like our, our books are actually available for hundreds of people to interact with. That's why I think in the digital age, that what we can do to bring the reality of the book to people is to photograph or better yet film or videotape somebody going through a book or film and videotape an artist in their studio creating a book. It's just the nature of the creation. Hi. I was wondering, what are you all working on now or next, or what's something fun that you're working on? Something fun. <laughs> well, um, you know, so we've had COVID. We've had these setbacks. Um, if there are any collectors or dealers who are waiting on books, I'm, I'm still saying about COVID, we're, we're behind. Um, I've, I've got a book about climate change coming. I've got a book about uh, of Irish haikus with, you know, landscapes from Ireland. We've got um, a book about um, the idea of um, the female body in, in its relationship to the Irish state, which is very, very deep. Uh, we've got, we just, there's a few books. I don't even want to mention them all. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> I'm so behind. <laughs> Um, we have a book uh, that's just about ready. It's at the bindery right now. It's called Island Whale, and it's a um, it's an interesting book because it's a it, it's not only the book itself, but it's an uh, it's an uh, it contains a number of objects. So it's housed in a um, Amy Berezo, who's a brilliant binder, who is doing the binding uh, for us on this. It's housed in a in a box that's in the shape of a ship captain's desk. The book itself is in the uh, format of, an, of a ship captain's whaling journal. And it really has to do, it's, it, it's stories from, uh, from the second century on about whales being mistaken for islands. And this is a, a recurring form of uh, folklore that has been passed down over the centuries. And the, the connection that the artist is making in this book is the end of um, the whaling industry happened because we started extracting our resources from dinosaur bones instead of uh, whale oil. So as soon as uh, oil was discovered, the whaling industry collapsed. It's really a metaphor about extraction over the ages. The box itself has a, uh, a cast, uh, a resin casting of a sperm whale tooth with an inscription on it, a scrimshaw into it. It's got a, a feather pen that's made from paper. It's got a rose that's also made out of paper. It's a, it's a brilliant book. It's uh, Annalie Scar as the artist. And then um, we've also got another one that we've just begun with the uh, photographer Joyce Tennyson and the uh, writer um, Diane Ackerman. So we're very excited about that. It's called Gold Trees, and that should be out sometime later this year. So, um, and that's dealing with um, uh, poetry about uh, the natural world and images from a brilliant woman photographer who will be celebrating her 50th anniversary of her first show at the Corcoran Gallery when she was one of the first women that was able to, uh, that they accepted to be able to show there. And she's still working on these golden trees that she did um, uh, 50 years ago. Oh, that is all 
I'm just very impressed. I'm, uh, I've started, I've been working with a lot of portraits that I have started with colored pencil. They're very intimate and small, and then I photograph them, and I digitize them, and I manipulate them, and then I collage photographs of prints that I've created on top of them. And the theme that's like kind of really calling me now is code switching. I don't know if you all know what that is, but um, for sure uh, folks of color know what code switching is. It's how different people um, present or veil or hide or uncover or um, feel comfortable uh, showing, demonstrating aspects of their references and their identity and their experiences in different platforms with other people. So it's about how in our very complex, layered, diverse society, many of us are um, not revealing or revealing aspects of who we are in order to, quote, get the job done and it's very <laughs> exhausting. <laughs> but it's something that I know f for a fact that almost all immigrants, almost all women, almost all people of color, almost all people of modest means deal with code switching on a daily basis. And when we're in the, uh, what I call the Wonder Bread platform, <laughs> we're doing it and in order su to succeed, you must do it because the general impression of American identity does not usually validate or include immigrants, people of color, women, and so on. So that's what I'm working on. And I love that you asked, like, what is fun? Because I think that's really important. I mean, I deal with some horrific stuff but I do enjoy what I'm doing. And I think it's, it's important to have fun with what you're doing. I think there's a celebratory um, joyfulness. And I think it's very important to understand that often out of something very difficult, and I know from listening to Jamie talk about the issues you're dealing with, it's, um, and, and for sure if you're Irish, you do understand a lot of this. Um, you're, you're coming from pain in a way and you're trying to make beauty. You're trying to change the track or the um, direction that that pain can take. So, Beautifully said. Well, I think that that's it. It's eight o'clock on the dot. Could, could I just um, yes, make please, a, cl jump a, in. a closing statement? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I thank you, Emily and Stephanie, for, uh, for what you did. Um, in, pu in pulling this all together, but, uh, but there was a, but there's somebody else that I think really needs to be acknowledged. Um, I uh, convinced uh, Mark Diminution um, for quite a while to write the introduction to our uh, uh, Tupon's 10th anniversary retrospective, and um, I just want to read what I wrote about Mark, because I think um, he's, he's someone who really deserves a lot of credit for where this has all uh, come from and has, has gone. Um, so, um, Tupons Press has been supported by collectors and librarians, too numerous to mention, but special thanks goes to Mark Dimination, rare book and special collections librarian at Library of Congress. We are immensely grateful for his unfailing support, not only of Gehenna and Tupons Presses, but of a number of promising young book artists during his tenure at the Library of Congress. He has built an artist book collection there into one of the nation's finest, and we are honored that he contributed to the introduction to this retrospective catalog, as well as what he's done for everyone here. So he's hiding in the back of the room, but thank Three you, Mark. Cheers for Mark.